How are you, Gabe? Doing well, Greg. Thanks for asking. Good How are you? I'm doing well as well. Good to see you again. Yeah. Um, so last week we, we ended our conversation kind of wrestling with the necessity of the material in an artwork mm-hmm. and if it's all about the perception of the viewer, if the material has very much of a place. And, and especially, I think, if, if someone was to go and read the entirety of Ellen Winner's book, then I think they'd come away with a better understanding that there's weight in both of those camps. Mm-hmm. Um, we kind of ended at a place. Well, well, how would you how would you say we ended the conversation? Yeah, well, where we ended was it was the question of forgeries um, was what kind of made this distinction between there actually being some weight in the material and the fact that people feel tricked or betrayed when they realize that something they thought was real isn't Mm -hmm. so with that said it's it seems like while the relationship between the viewer and the artwork or the viewer and the artist is really important Mm -hmm. um, you really want whatever you're looking at to be authentic or real whatever that means yeah yeah it's hard to say the material matters Mm -hmm. because at the same time it's still our perception of the material Mm -hmm. but it's really important that the material is what we think it is Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we feel deceived. Yeah. And so suddenly our cognitive sort of state of mind changes significantly, which to me is evidence of the fact that it's not just what's in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's not just that beauty's in the eye of the beholder. There is a huge part in which, you know, I'm using that phrase because it's common, but perhaps a more appropriate phrase for our conversation would be like, art is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Or you hear this all the time in the kinds of statements like, whatever we think of as art is art yeah um and there's a sense where it's like that seems reasonable it Mm -hmm. seems reasonable from a cognitive sense of tracking what people think they're doing when they're looking at art and when they're having the experience they would call art so much of it is psychological yeah and especially with some of the things that we touched on uh, like modern art and contemporary art where things that might not be considered art are pulled into the gallery setting and then all of a sudden treated as art. Yeah. I think the other thing to note is uh, that definition of art and kind of the, the material being what you think it is really ties in with the idea of the nexus or the focal point that we touched on in our very first conversation. Right, right. That both art serves as something to kind of hold our focus <laughs> And that that focus is uh, important because we're giving it meaning. But then at the same time, if what you're focusing on turns out to be something forged or not real, then that changes your perspective on, you know, your entire past experience as well. Right. You've seen me do this in class. I like to talk to my students about their cognition Mm -hmm. and especially teaching basic design. So much of being able to design properly is You have to understand how the human creature works. Mm -hmm. Um, If you don't understand that, you're going to make some mistakes uh, because you just don't know how the system works. But I like to to ask students, you know, are you in control of your thoughts? You know, the general answer, everyone says yes. Mm -hmm. And then what do I usually yell? You you normally yell just a random random word. Yeah, banana. Yeah. And then it's when I say banana, usually the majority of the room will admit that they start thinking about bananas. Mm -hmm. It's like that's why advertisement works. If advertisements couldn't actually get your attention and make you think of something else, like literally that sentence, make you think something else, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't work. Yeah. That's how they function. The material world has these nexus points, like as as Barry says, or the 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 center of a nexus of reminders. There's like a physical thing. Like I like to talk about it like this that art is this weird thing where it's like there are places and things you can go look at Mm -hmm. and they'll change your life yeah it's like that's weird it really is that they're these and sometimes they're they're small or they seem relatively insignificant like the idea that paint on a piece of paper or paint on a canvas could literally change the way you think could change your perception on reality is yeah it's almost unnerving it's strange to think like oh that i can look at something that's not even real an image of something and that might really profoundly change how I think about anything related to that image for the rest of my life. Right, right. And that's where we mentioned the Francis Allais piece of the fox running through the portrait gallery, where it's like there's something unique about us. Mm-hmm. 
where we see the art and we connect with it. And it's like, but it's, it's in both, like both sides of that equation are necessary. Yeah. And, um, I think I mentioned this last week, that whole thing of, um, uh, I think it's Bruce Springsteen that art is like one plus one equals three Yeah. instead of two. And that's where, so it gets down to this question of why that, so we, we might've said the question we might've had before was something like, where is the meaning? Is Mm -hmm. it in the viewer or is it in the object Mm -hmm. and now it's more like so why does like it's somehow in both yeah why does that happen yeah and and how not just why is this happening but like it seems ridiculous to say that physical material could have that much power over something as uh you know we would like to think as like kind of powerful as our consciousness or our thought or something like that but that is the case and that's that's a question that we hopefully are going to start to talk about. Yeah, so I had you read Malcolm Geith's Lifting the Veil. What, why Why do you think that this relates to that question? Yeah, so a little bit of background on the book, first of all. It's probably my favorite thing I think I think we've read so far in the course of this, uh, in the course of these conversations. Um, the first two chapters especially are fantastic, and what he's essentially talking about is the necessity of imagination and imagination as a tool for engaging with the spiritual. And then from there, he goes on to talk about art being a key form of imagination and also imagination's necessity in art. And he starts to really bring all these ideas together of spirituality and art and imagination and creativity and almost combines them into like a singular a singular point in this book mm-hmm. where he starts to kind of connect them and interlay them and by the time that uh by the time you're done with those two chapters it's almost difficult to distinguish you know what's the difference between creativity and spirituality or what's the difference yeah, yeah. between um like a true imagining of something and art right right and that's one of the things um so Geit, he's an Anglican, um, I might have this wrong, like I don't know their actual, I think he's a priest is what it would be called. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know their exact ranking, I'm not Anglican. Um, and he's a poet, mm-hmm. and uh, so that means he's coming from a Judeo-Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting about, especially the first two chapters, like it is, it is filled with Christian language. But I want to point out that, think about where our conversation has come, that to some extent, you, you can appreciate Geit even if you don't hold his same theology mm-hmm. because he's getting at the weird that weird mystery mm-hmm. the fact that there are things that you can see and they're just they're just material yeah like paint is just like an oil painting is just really slowly dried pigment that has been put in oil on top of canvas that has been primed with something mm-hmm. that's all it is yeah and if I were to but but we know that it's more than that. And even if people would argue, if they're really, really good materialists, really good modernist materialists, mm-hmm. the fact is they don't act that way. Mm-hmm. They can try to convince themselves. But when people walk into a museum, even when they hate you know, the Pollocks and the Rothkos, they still look at them. Yeah. Like the fact that it gets our attention, like if it was nothing, if it was just material, we wouldn't look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're you're walking, especially after you're no longer a kid, you're walking down the sand dunes. You're not looking at the sand. Mm-hmm. You're looking at the things that you that your all of your subconscious believes are appropriate for your attention yeah. and are relevant to your experience. And try as they might to say it's just paint, mm-hmm. they still look at it. It is true. Where it's, I, I think the question to ask. And I think that the the kind of the thought pattern of of the modernist and materialist is still a useful thought pattern to go down. But at the end of the day, it, it begs this question of when you're in a gallery, why are people not interested in the latex paint on the drywall in between mm-hmm. two pieces of work? Yeah. Why are we why are we interested on what's happening inside of these frames? Why are we interested in these actual images? Yeah. And what makes them any more important than 
you know, the surface of this table, which neither yeah. neither of us have acknowledged up to this point in the conversation. Right, right. And there's so many there's so many modern and postmodern artists who are trying to like push against this idea. There's a really uh, a great piece. Um, I used to hang out in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston all the time mm -hmm. as a graduate student in their at their school. Yeah. And um, right by this cafe, there's this piece that is a massive photograph that's maybe 95 percent the scale of the wall that it's on. Mm -hmm. So it's like they took a photo of that wall, yep. shrunk it maybe 95, like, you know, scaled it down from 100% to 95%. Yeah. So there's a few marks on the cement wall that you can see on, right next to it on mm -hmm. the photograph, just slightly smaller. Yep. And it's color appropriate. Like it, in that lighting, they look the same color. And largely, most people don't notice it's a work of art. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like, that's, that's what I mean by, you know, the photo is so different than painting but it's it when it blends into the environment when we don't notice it then we don't have that experience of art mm -hmm. and it takes you know a weird art student like me sitting at that cafe <laughs> over the course of two years i would go there maybe three times a week yep and you just like like then you notice that that's not just a wall over there yeah and then you see it and it's like you know maybe you think that's really interesting or maybe you think that's dumb it's right. a, a joke played on us by artists which it kind of is on, on, it's at least that on one level. I was going to say, on, yeah. on one level, I feel like a lot of art is that. But Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I mean, there's this recent piece that uh, oh, somewhere in like Norway, a museum paid this, these artists to make a, to do a commission of something like 80,000 80, euros. And the artists um, sent them blank canvas titled, Take the Money and Run. <laughs> and they've been sued. So like the courts found them guilty of yeah. fraud. Um, which is really interesting, but you know, that is happening in the art world. Yeah. Like all of those things where, where like a, a lay audience goes in and thinks, are they just trying to make fun of me? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Which, which is like, I, I think it's reprehensible. I think that's foolish. Oh, yeah. We're gonna like destroy our audience, and mm -hmm. we're gonna destroy trust in the audience, mm -hmm. or the, we're gonna destroy the audience's trust in us mm -hmm. if we do that all the time. But, but to get back to the point of, we act like. Um, James Elkins, a art historian at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, wrote a book. I think it's called The Strange Place of Religion in Contemporary Arts. I could be wrong. That might be a title of a different book. But Elkins has written about um, how religion and art go together mm -hmm. and if they go together. Yeah. And he largely says, like, no, there's not really a place in it. And the reason he says that is because he says art is a religion. Yeah. And if you think about it, like museums as temples and these spaces and classes where you learn like the right appropriate language, just like you do if you're going to any church, mm -hmm. there's a lot of aspects where it is that. Yeah. And I think it's exactly because everyone who cares about art understands that there's something happening between object and viewer that is that third thing yeah. that somehow transcends the material order. So I'm hoping as we talk about Geit, folks can understand that even though you and I, I think, agree with a lot of Geit's religious principles, mm -hmm. that those principles are can be far more neutral because he's he's mostly just saying there's a metaphysical realm and art is points to it. I think so, and I think I, so. One of my favorite classes I ever ever took was a a class on world religions, essentially, basically going through all these different religious traditions and all these different spiritual traditions and. It was a really pretty comprehensive survey. We did everything from indigenous American religions to uh, Eastern religion, Western religion, Judeo-Christian tradition, Abrahamic religion, everything. And at the end of the class, you have to break down what are the eight, what are the eight things that all religions have in common. At the very top of that list, the first thing that people would always talk about was this category that we ended up calling the material expression. Like, mm. what is the material expression of this religion? Because it turns out that if a religion or a spiritual practice doesn't have a material expression, it's really hard to figure out how to classify it. Yeah. Like, it, it, you start thinking of it more as like, well, it might just be a philosophy, actually. But as soon as you have this element of material expression, uh, it really starts to feel like a spirituality or a religion. Yeah. And then on top of that, this idea of the material expression, when we looked at the material expressions of all these different religions and cultures, oftentimes that expression 
was the art movements that those cultures were associated with. Like if you yeah. look at the religious material expression of Japan, for example, you're going to have a really hard time separating it out from the religious tradition or the spiritual tradition of Japan. Yeah, we might have to read Eric Neumann next if that's where our conversation goes. Um, been trying to hold you off of it because it's just so much work. But, um, <laughs> but that, I think, will evidence what we're trying to get at here in our in our sort of preamble leading up to Geit is, uh, you know, all of the, the Jungian archetypes are based on this foundation that somehow all human beings mm-hmm. are searching for meaning. Mm-hmm. You know, like Viktor Frankl's very great book, Man's Search for Meaning, yeah. looking at, you know, the psychology of Holocaust victims and perpetrators mm-hmm. and how there's something common between those. It's really a powerful book. Yeah. But it's getting at this fundamental truth that, well, maybe it's not a truth, but it's a, well, the fundamental truth is that every human being is looking for meaning mm-hmm. and seemingly the best place to look for it is like here around us with this stuff. Yeah. And we keep doing it. We keep on making these material manifestations of this thing that we're searching for. Mm-hmm whether we're accurate or not is up for each individual i think to judge it is i think the other thing i would um so so one of my one of my best friends uh recently got married and he's a part of the roman catholic tradition and his wife is also roman catholic so they had a full roman catholic Mm -hmm. uh wedding and at the very beginning of uh he was actually raised protestant so his entire Protestant family was there. There was a bunch of Protestant people in, in the in the like the audience or in the mass, and the priest who had kind of been instructed in delivering a Roman Catholic mass to a crowd full of Protestants opened up by saying, "Before we start, what I want you all to understand is that the meaning of these sacraments is something that we hold very dear, and it is that each one of these sacraments is a physical expression of an invisible reality." Mm-hmm taking away that focus from, you know, it's all about the bread, it's all about the wine, and trying to explain, like, no, no, here we believe that these physical things that we're doing, this physical space you're in, is is actually just a symbol of something much deeper behind it, which yeah. I think really gets at... It's slightly, it's probably slightly different there, because Protestants will hear the word symbol mm-hmm. differently than Catholics will hear They it. will. Because... The, the huge thing there is what, do you, what you said earlier, correct me, like, let me see if I'm phrasing it properly. Um, it's a, a physical reminder or a physical manifestation of an invisible reality. I think you said physical signs. It was the exact, oh, interesting. It was the exact it's signs. physical signs of an invisible reality. Yeah, it yeah. might have been its exact language. Everyone, everyone like, is trying to get at this idea, but, but Catholics generally, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm not Catholic, I don't want to... <laughs> Step on any toes here. Yeah, um, I've only done that a few times in my life. Um, believe in a, like a, there's a significant inter, interconnection there, mm-hmm. and frequently Protestants, which is why a lot of Protestants are like mad at arts and mm-hmm. and lead you know iconoclasm where they like smash artwork, um, are more interested in the symbol that mm-hmm. the point of the thing is to point at that divine reality. Yep. Whereas the Catholics are more like, no, it's an intermixing where the divine reality is here in this presence, mm-hmm. not this is a sign that points to something else. There's lots of there's lots of slippage between these terms, symbol, sign, icon. Yep. Lots of there's lots of different realms like semiotics, advertising and marketing, you know, your phone, it's like we call those icons. Yep. But then we also look at Mary and we call that an icon. Yeah. It's like if I click on Mary, nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, and, and then we would call, you know, uh, just Justin Bieber an icon, <laughs> right? Pop icon, right? Yeah, like we yeah. have all these well, different. And, yeah. yeah, and then Madonna's a sex symbol. Yeah, uh-huh. like so. There's a lot of like weirdness as to what exactly does that mean. But every single person is is thinking this through. Mm-hmm. Everyone has something they esteem as holy. Mm-hmm. That if they found out that the physical reality of it was not true they would feel betrayed mm-hmm. just like those forgeries. Yeah. And that's like, there's something there. And that's where I want to like, let's dive into a little bit of guy. I want to read the first sentence. Cause I think his first sentence is easy to kind of just brush over as a creative, mm-hmm. but it is, um, shockingly radical in its statement. What do you know it? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. it. I remember reading it and being like, wow. Yeah. I, I will also say, in these first two chapters, it's incredibly 
I would say it's incredibly well written. The end result of that is that there is no kind of fluff to this text. Pretty much every yeah. line is a pretty a pretty radical idea or something that really I think you can spend a lot of time on. Yeah, but I think I think that has to do with him being a poet. Um, probably something about precision. I think it's a. Uh, uh, I forget which. There's one of the Irish poets who said that poetry is language at its most precise. Hmm. Um, and there's some element of that. Like this book is, I think it's only, you know, it's got lots of pictures and it's only 111 pages. So yeah. it's relatively short. But it could be, it, could, it can be a long read. It can be a really long <laughs> yeah, read. Yeah, exactly. You want to go through it slow. Yeah. But so his first sentence, this book is a defense of the imagination as a truth bearing faculty. And more than that, it is an appeal to artists, poets, sculptors, storytellers, and filmmakers to kindle our imaginations for Christ who is himself the kindling imagination of God, who brings all things into being. So it's like you got all that, the Christian stuff at the end, but the really radical thing there, the imagination, as a, it's a defense of the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. Um, what the heck does that mean? Yeah, and I'll just first off say that it comes across as, um, I think especially in... Well, I'll, I'll say this. And until pretty recently, there was a pretty stark divide between, you know, what was happening in your head and what was reality. Like now we're kind of starting to have this understanding of, um, I think we talked about the placebo effect, but we're, we're talking more and more about how real our thoughts and emotions and things like that are and how they can actually kind of physically manifest, especially, you know, in our, in our bodies. But, yeah, yeah. but until, until recently, like the idea of like, oh no, that's all in your head was a real and kind of like something that people really went off of. There's reality and then there's whatever's happening in your head. Um, yeah. And I think that this this kind of idea of like imagination as truth is, is really in stark contrast to that idea of like you thinking about things bring some level of truth to them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a... Madeline Lingle has a great book called Walking on Water. Um, in it, she talks about how when she she you know had a very rich her her parents were one of her her father was an actor her mother i believe was a musician or something mm -hmm. like that she was also creative she grew up in a very creative household and yeah. when she finally went to grade school the teacher said that madeline was a storyteller and she meant that in a negative huh. she meant like she tells lies. Yeah. And madeline as a little young madeline didn't understand that because she was like proud to be a storyteller yeah. that's what mm -hmm. she was already writing at a young age yeah. and you know she becomes famous as a storyteller mm -hmm. writing a wrinkle in time and um and so it's it's interesting though because frequently we think of the imagination doesn't lead to truth it bears forth like fancy mm -hmm. it be bears forth things that are false but they're nice they're amusing mm -hmm. they're it's like it's very odd to say that thing you do where you make stuff up, mm -hmm. that brings truth forward. Yeah. Like, what do you what do you think he's getting at there? How is he just wrong? Like, that seems <laughs> insane. No, it really, it really. I think at, at first glance, it really does. Like thinking about like, it feels like it strays in this territory of like, um, reality is whatever you want it to be. Reality is kind of whatever you think it is. Um, you're. It, it feels like it's a defense of the subjective. Mm -hmm. And what I actually think it is, is it's a defense of the objective through through a really subjective means. Yeah. How, how can that be? Like, how is it not just a defense of the subjective of saying your reality is whatever you want it to be? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really complicated question. Um, but... Through this book, what I think he's essentially getting at is that there's something about the creative process which has imagination as like a key, a key part, like a tenant of it, that there is a way of carefully imagining or, or imagining within, I don't want to say guidelines, but imagination as a part of a process can lead us to, to reality. Mm. Mm. Yeah, think about it like, um, I like to I like to show chairs in my class all the time. Oh, yes. I like to use chairs as as examples. Yeah, because they're really um, 
I think we can put an image of a chair here. We, oh, we should do Joseph Kosuth's The Three Chairs. That's the that's the great image to put up. All right. Um, like, I put a chair in front of the classroom. I literally usually just stand up and f- mm-hmm. fling my chair out there. Yeah. And I ask, what is this? And everyone says... A chair. Normally everybody's quiet because they assume it's a trick question. <laughs> that's that's right. actually exactly. what happens. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's a chair. And it's like, well, what is a chair? Mm-hmm. And Joseph Kosuth has this great thing of like the piece where it's a photo of a chair. Mm-hmm. There's the physical chair. And then there's the dictionary definition of the chair. It's like, which which one's the chair? Yeah. Is it one chair? Is it three chairs? Mm-hmm. What kind of chair is it? Image, physical, idea yeah mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's yeah. trying to get at yep. this strange trinity of object viewer other mm-hmm. like idea yeah and um it's interesting to think about like obviously when all of my students say chair they're right mm-hmm. it is a chair mm-hmm. but it's like if i pick up that chair and i throw it out the window i'm using a chair i guess but I'm not using it to be a chair. I'm using it as a battering ram. Yeah. So is it a battering ram all of a sudden? Yeah. Or or the question that I think also comes up is, how do you how do you know it's a chair? And and also, um, so it's interesting because the classroom we're in, I th- I like I can picture the chair you're talking about. It's kind of a strange chair. Mm-hmm. It's it's a chair that is it's teal in color and it's got these two huge pads and it's missing an arm. And then it's got a, a straight base and a bunch of wheels. So it looks yeah. nothing like if you said, what does a chair look like? You're going to get one of those four-legged dining room chairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's the same thing of like, see, you're already getting at it. Like, why didn't someone say fabric, plastic, wheels, and metal? Because mm-hmm. yeah. it is that. It is that. And and this idea that, especially when I'm not sitting in it and it's rolling across the room, how do you know it's a chair? Yeah. Like, when I'm sitting in it, you know that chairs are things that human beings sit in. That's a thing that is being sat in by a human being, mm-hmm. i.e. it's a chair. Yeah. And it's the same reason why I can take a bucket and I can sit on that and now the bucket's a chair yeah. or a stool, depending on how <laughs> nuanced you want to be with your language. But, you know, you can say stools are chairs. Like that's at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, it's like we're, we, everyone imagines the chair in its proper function and they shortcut they don't go and say, they don't give me a list of materials. Mm-hmm. They jump to, it's a chair. And it's like, it seems like a stupid example, but it's so key to understanding how we as human beings are interacting with the world. Because if we didn't do that with everything, then we wouldn't ever see anything. Mm-hmm. You know, it'd be like, there's there's carpet and it's got fibers. And how do I know how closely I need to look at it yeah. before I decide okay, no, it really is a safe floor to walk on. Yeah. It's like, but I could keep digging. I could get a microscope and I could keep looking deeper and I could keep seeing details. Mm -hmm. But instead, we just like, it is what it is. I see what it is. Or or back to the the chair. Like there's this really weird thing where it's like the wheels aren't actually, you know, technically attached to that chair in the same way that they're not the same material. It's not a single piece. But there's never a question of are the wheels part of a chair versus is the chair part of the table that it's touching right now? Like we're right. also able to separate out like right. these things are all in the chair group. These things are all in the floor group. These right. things are all in the table group, even well, though they're the same material often. Yeah. Well, and even you can see uh, there are different creatures that have different amounts of imagination, different amounts of capacity for imagination. Because one of the things that I do is I never point at the chair I always do this. Hmm. I try to gesture. And so why doesn't anyone say, like when I say, what is this? Why don't they say, like, I don't, it's a way to display your hands? Yeah. They always look to what I'm gesturing at. Yeah. They, that's an act of the imagination. Yep. You know, like a dog, you're like, ball. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look at the ball. It looks at your hand. Yeah. Because it doesn't have the same capacity of imagination mm-hmm. to say, I, like to realize that it's an act of the imagination to understand that this means not here's my hand. Mm-hmm. It means follow my hand to the thing that is nearby. Yeah. And it's, and it, you know, we're, we're doing so many levels of imaginative mm-hmm. processing that have nothing to do with reasoning. Yeah. Now you could say, well, it's reasoning built on pattern recognition from the past. Yeah. But the pattern recognition from the past has to have a jump of imagination at some point in time. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, what he's getting at of like, the imagination brought forward the truth. 
The truth is I want people to look at the chair mm -hmm. and I do this and they make an imaginative leap and arrive at the place that we're all trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's crazy is that that would work with both a slightly different hand gesture, a different person making the hand gesture and even a chair that like, like chairs that kind of push the boundaries of what chairs are. It's like, you can really make some pretty huge leaps there that like, yeah. like a general wave in the direction. What's that over there? It's the same thing as this or this. Mm -hmm. And then you could be gesturing at anything vaguely chair shaped. Right. Right. And this, yeah. this comes down to a field of psychology that's looking at what's called relevance realization. Mm -hmm. How do we realize what is relevant? And it isn't just rational. Mm -hmm. It is also highly imaginative. Yeah. As in like, I mean that in the sense of it, the, the rationale is seeing something occurring and the imagination is, uh, deductions and perhaps even jumps of logic that allow you to picture what could happen in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, if you imagine we're in this room and a fire breaks out and we can't get out that door, we then have to start thinking, what are some things that I could, I could see working to break this window? Yeah. It's like, that's the imagination. Yep. And the truth is like, it will lead us to something. There's something in this room we could break that window with if we needed to. Yeah. And it would be, it would be brought to us by our imagination. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's a little subtle thing to think there is that if it can be a truth-bearing faculty, it can also be a falsity-bearing faculty. It can. It's not just bringing truth. No. It can also bring ho horrible things as well. For sure, which is why I said that I think it is a part of a process and a process that can be um, practiced and kind of honed. Because like you said, there is this element of pattern recognition which is a real way that we see things and recognize objects like there are people who train themselves to be incredibly good at pattern recognition mm -hmm. and they can they can make those imaginative jumps much faster and much better than another person could like for example somebody in the medical profession has trained themselves in the pattern recognition of seeing certain things yeah. and being able to imagine all of the scenarios and then to narrow down what the most important right. important thing is. You right. know, like this person's lips are blue, they're acting strange. I don't know. They they can they can make all of these jumps and then imagine the best possibility for what they right. think they should act like. Right, right. Whereas I, who have not had that training, could imagine something completely wrong. I could mm -hmm. see, lips are blue. I don't know. Their lips are blue, maybe they're cold or something like yeah. that. Yeah. They've done psychological tests on this of like different experts but are, they're primed with like different emotional feelings, so to speak. So they'll look at a person and they're like the, the person, like they'll get psychologists in the room and they don't know that they're being tested. They're the, they think they're a part of the test, but actually it's them who's being tested. And they'll have someone sit across from them and they will tell them different things beforehand, mm -hmm. which means they're looking at this person with something in their imagination mm -hmm. and it completely changes the way they interact with them. And it's, so it's like a complete thing of whatever you're imagining, you start seeing. Mm -hmm. And you can see this all the time. It's like, it's exactly the same reason why we have issues with police officers is sometimes they're under attack and they need to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And you might argue, given the da danger of their job, maybe that's a good place to imagine all the time, yeah. which is extremely paranoid if you think about that. And so, but if you imagine someone, a police officer is imagining they might die in two seconds all the time, they might interpret something that's is completely benign mm -hmm. as a threat. Yeah. But it's because our imagination is largely involved in this whole entire cognitive process of figuring out what's relevant, what's yeah. important. You know, was that, was the guy slipping his hand into his pocket reaching for a gun or was he nervous? And so he was like, didn't know what to do with his hands. Yeah. It's like it depends on where you are, where you're, what you start imagining and what you start thinking about and you start putting onto the situation. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like in lots of situations, like most of the time in art, luckily, <laughs> there's usually not life and death, death circumstances, though yeah. a few performance artists have gone there. Yep. Um, and, and so we don't have as high a stakes. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those places where it's like we can, we can perhaps test our imagination or stretch our imagination to see what kinds of truths come out of that, mm -hmm. which is like a, but, but all of that to say that second half of his sentence is really important in the sense of if imagination is a truth bearing faculty, what is truth 
and what is the truth that we want to pursue. Mm -hmm. And he follows it up for himself with this statement about Christianity. So he uses this moral system to say, this is how this, this is how you know what to go after. And the reality is, is that everyone's doing that. We all have some sort of foundational principles that guide us, whether they're religious or humanistic or evolutionary or even self-serving like like sociopaths. Every single bit of what part of this is relevant to me is coming from a value system that feeds off of our imagination so that we can interact with the world. Exactly. So there's, there's this whole... Um... I think that that's that's kind of the the key of this entire chapter, right? Is that he's both defined his his idea of truth and his his moral system that he's working for, and then he goes on to break down a lot of art as kind of this imaginative practice that he sees as uh, leading to new insight or new truths about those pieces of art. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look at one of them. Uh, this good old Shakespeare. Let me find. I think it's page nineteen. Yeah, I can't remember if he has a longer... No, this is the whole thing. So he has this great section where it's like, uh, oh, Shakespeare thought of all this a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Everything Guide is getting at, he's like, it's actually all in Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, I believe this is... uh, I think this is from A Midsummer's Night. I could be wrong. But there's a soliloquy, and Shakespeare says, The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives the airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Mm-hmm. It's always just good to read Shakespeare. It is, yeah. Um, what What do you, how did you, well, can, can you remember how Geit summarizes this section? Like he goes on for, he talks about this for, let's see here. Uh, two and a half pages longer, which is which is long for a guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like how yeah. short the chapters are. He really dives into it actually. Brief. Um, but um, yeah. So I think I think he kind of he almost breaks it down line by line, if I remember correctly. And the first thing that he he kind of settles on Oops. is um, <laughs> might need to cut that. Part. <laughs> there might be some distracting audio there. Yeah. Um, the first thing that he kind of settles on in his breakdown of Shakespeare is this idea of observation. He talks about the poet's eye and the frenzy and this movement between heaven and earth and earth and heaven. And this, yeah. this kind of, I think, I think the best word for it might be imaginative observation. Mm-hmm. And what he's, what he's talking about there is essentially, you see, it's so interesting to me that he talks about it through the idea of poetry because in the arts, we often talk about things like painting and drawing and photography as learning new ways of seeing. That's mm-hmm. oftentimes how they're talked about. And the key skills in those classes when you take them are actually way less focused around techniques such as you know shading or how you should hold your pencil or how you should make your line and way more about like, look at this and tell me where the brightest part of it actually is or Mm -hmm. how many colors do you actually see in a single piece of fabric or what's actually happening in the negative space in between you know these two vases can you describe that negative space to me yeah and and what he's talking about there is very similar the poet's eye is moving between uh earth and heaven heaven and earth and he's imagining a new way of seeing, or he's observing in a different way. Yeah, I think you can really break it down even more detailed to say Shakespeare's getting at this idea that there's actually like, there's kind of like two ways that art gets formed. Mm. One of them is by looking at material, like that's earth. Yeah. You know, looking at material, and when you do that, suddenly you're able to imagine interesting ideas. Like, you know, this could be, even Shakespeare talks about this sometimes of like the muses, the inspiration, Mm. you know, so you have artists like myself who are always down in the dirt rummaging around. Mm -hmm. And then from that, suddenly it's like, Oh my God, there's an idea I didn't realize was there. Yeah. And it's like, I, you know, earth to heaven. It's like matter idea. That's the same thing. Yeah. It's like I work with matter and it raises ideas. I suddenly start seeing ideas out of it. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing, just different language for earth to heaven. Mm-hmm. And then some people are more cognitive. They're looking at the idea. They're looking at the heavenly realm. Yeah. And they're sitting there thinking. And then suddenly that's like, wait, I could make that into a physical manifest. Like, how do I get at that? Yeah. I think that's James Terrell. Like, James Terrell is a very, like, philosophical mind. 
and he's thinking about these ideas and it's through the ideas that he begins to understand how can I bring that into a physical space mm -hmm. and so that's like the you know some I, I, I mean I think that this is almost like a, at university it's almost true yeah or college um, you know I think like the philosophers who then write things are obvious are like in the idea realm mm -hmm. trying to bring it into the physical yeah and frequently the visual artists are in the physical world trying to bring it into the idea I was going to say, so I, I recently had a talk with another one of our professors about where she gets inspiration from her work from. And even though her pieces tend to be incredibly uh, metaphysical or dealing with these really complicated ideas, uh, the way that she was talking about them was entirely through physical exploration. That it was, it was through this, um, uh, this, this kind of thinking about what does it actually mean that I'm taking these actions with these objects? What does it actually mean that I'm putting brush to canvas in this way. What does it mean that I'm choosing these colors? What do these colors mean? And it was it was way less you'd expect, oh, if you're making a piece that's so clearly about a spiritual idea, you might think, well, you're gonna start by figuring out exactly what that spiritual idea is and then how do you best represent it in a painting? And that's not at all the process that she was talking about. She was talking about, oh, I started painting and I kept on painting and I kept on painting and then these ideas started to kind of um, arise almost from the decoration and the attention to detail I was putting into these paintings. Yeah, yeah. So, so well, and as, so sorry, to continue with Shakespeare. So the poet is glancing from heaven to earth or from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies <coughs> forth, as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes. Mm -hmm. Like that's exactly what you just described. Yeah, it's like like one or one way or the other. It's like these things that didn't have shape. Suddenly, we start realizing them and giving them form. Mm -hmm. And he and he and the body is super important there in the sense it's not that it's like manifests. It's like it's given a physical presence. Like a body is a physical thing mm -hmm. in and of itself. And so we like and and Geit grasps onto this term throughout the book of talking about bodying forth mm. giving something body especially in the sense of in the poet it's like what, what do you mean they're not making physical things mm -hmm. it's like well they're saying words and those words have a physicality like they're here in the actual space we're vibrating the air yeah and it's like that's what they're doing they're they're and then for a moment it might be a body that fades real fast but it like lives on in our imagination and in the hearers and of course we write it down and it becomes substantiated in mm -hmm. a different way but every little like creative act is pulling material together so that it's not just like like until i talked about the air in this room as being the body of our words we weren't really thinking about the air yeah you know like now all the air is charged as a body yeah somehow yes and i think that's something that's that's interesting is that so many of the things that we interact with on a daily basis and I would argue almost all of them are really these these things of we would call them things of like earth like physical things air vibrations energy light um in your case things that are more materially based like wood and and things like metal and stuff like that and they're they're around us but at the same time they carry I mean, so much meaning. The fact is that even when we're talking, like you just said, it's this idea of things that are kind of physical of earth, air and vibration are holding meaning that mean you can both understand and have a conversation through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, and our, we're, we're using the physical things to go into another realm of imagination mostly. Mm -hmm. of, I, I, have to, I have to make the leap of imagination that sounds can come together to mean ideas. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, the imagination is bodying forth, hopefully something true. Yeah. Perhaps just something distracting. Uh, <laughs> but so, so uh, gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. That's really, those are two interesting little things there. But that habitation, we've been saying that basically, but we've been saying like nexus, mm -hmm. like the nexus of a series of reminders or like a, a point on a matrix of meaning, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a node. Yeah. It's like that local habitation. 
which is really unique. A lot of postmodern artists are pushing against this, mm -hmm. this idea of the necessity of a local habitation. Yeah. And that's even, we mentioned last week, um, uh, Benamine's The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction is pushing against this idea that the local habitation matters. Yeah. And he's more like, no, the idea is what matters, yep. which is where you can see through through modernism and into postmodernism, a lot of a disconnect between the physical and the idea. Mm -hmm. To the point of, you know, you have Saul LeWitt, who makes artworks that are just instructions for how to make a Saul LeWitt artwork. Yeah. The physical manifestation doesn't matter. Yep. The idea the matters. The idea is what is actually the artwork, yeah. Right. But then it's interesting because once someone has made a Saul, like, so, so the... Um, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Arts, Mass Mocha, has a whole building of Saul Lewitts. Mm -hmm. If I went in there with a sledgehammer, they would still sue me <laughs> for ruining a Saul Lewitt. Yeah. Even though Saul Lewitt's art isn't the physical thing, it's just the idea. Exactly. That's what I'm being told, at least. Yeah. And it's like, that, that's not true. Like, if you went in there with red paint, they would get you for defacing a Saul Lewitt. Mm -hmm. But you're not defacing a Saul Lewitt because the manifestation isn't it according to the theories behind it, yeah, behind conceptual art. But that's where it's like, e even if you can put yourself in a realm where you believe that, mm -hmm. we still, we still as humans, we go back to this thing of the physical matters. Mm -hmm. Like, if I go in there and just paint all the walls red, I am defacing Saul Lewitt's work. Yeah, yeah, it's this uh, really... I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating idea that as important as the ideas are, or no matter how much value we place on these ideas, um, we're still, I think I'd say there, there's a lot we can tell for how defensive we are of the physical expression or the symbols. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that, that appears in, I think, a lot of ways. And one of the things that I, I tend to think about actually in this idea of the kind of the interconnecting between the physical and the metaphysical is like humans or everybody for the most part i'd say at least at like some core level probably everybody agrees that humans have worth and that worth is normally pinned down to something that's a lot a lot more than just our physical bodies like the physical body while it's honored and things like that isn't agreed to be the part of the human that is the most important yeah yeah and um until you have something, something you want to say to that. Yeah, there's, there, well, it's naive to think that almost everyone thinks that because there's a few people who don't, unfortunately. There, there are people who don't. But regardless, it's, it's a kind of a, a standing is that there's some part of a human that is really, uh, I think we would call it the soul or, you know, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is in the human that makes a human yeah. worth something. And at the same time, we're incredibly defensive of our bodily and like autonomy, or our body rights. Like that's yeah, the yeah. thing that we're very like, yeah. no, that's that's the body. That's where the important thing is. Right. That's where those ideas or the thing that makes a human is. And because of that, you can't you can't do things to a human's body, even though that's not necessarily who they are. Right, and that's that's the this is the big confusion in the contemporary era is the fact that in modernity. Largely, not all of them, but the, the general kind of trope of modernity is that the material is all that matters, that you don't need an idea. You don't need to refer to the, to the world. You don't need to refer to a narrative. You don't need to tell a story. You don't need to refer to a religious idea. Mm -hmm. You can just look at the paint on the canvas, mm -hmm. and that's enough. And to some degree, they're right, but they also, you know, in the Greenberg line of reasoning, it's like that's all it actually is, mm -hmm. that what you're experiencing, that's the only important part is the, the kind of uh, amazing, interesting experience of material. And yet, even Greenberg, after Ad Reinhardt really, like, mm -hmm. <sighs> really challenges him on this by producing extremely boring to look at paintings, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, even Greenberg kind of like starts backing away from that. But you can also see like, oh, this is why the modern artists were so keen on things like untitled mm -hmm. or untitled number seven, untitled number eight. And it's getting at that last thing that Shakespeare mentions of local habitation and a name. There's something about a name mm -hmm. where it's like specific, you know, you're Gabe, I'm Greg, I'm not number 137, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even we see this in the modern era of when we start doing this, you get Auschwitz, you yeah. get the people as number. 
It's like as soon as you get rid of name, you get rid of individualism. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we do that to our artwork, it starts to become extremely offensive. Like, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of ways to think about this. Some people see this as an affront. Like the modern artists were doing things that were attacking this kind of order that Shakespeare is talking about. I think of it more like they were testing to see if it was right. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of it, like the postmodern swing, the pendulum goes the opposite direction, away from material and all towards idea. But the it's a response showing, no, they were wrong. Mm -hmm. Like like even Pollock himself, when he's really listening to Greenberg, he starts numbering his paintings instead of naming them. Mm -hmm. And then close to the end of his life, you know, he, he died, I think, I forget who said it, but it's like, he wrapped himself around a telephone pole at 75 miles an hour or whatever. Yep. You know, it's like before he did that, he had gone back to naming his paintings again. Yeah. And he even he even has a in interviews talked about how he's not interested in this pure experience of material. He's interested in the things that come out of that. He's seeing that even in his drip painting, that something is bodying forth out of that. And he wants to know what that is. And that's why he was delving into Jung and archetypes and things like that. But so he even starts to shift away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have something to say there? I think I think the main thing is we've already we already discussed this in a previous episode. We already went pretty in depth yeah, into yeah, politics. Yeah. Uh, into you got me. You got me monologuing like a teacher. <laughs> no, it's all, all uh, good. But uh, so, and, and on the other hand, you have the postmodernists coming in. And they start leaning heavily into it's just the idea. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it's really interesting to look at Solowit, the conceptual artist, mm -hmm. and this kind of it's all just the idea realm. And you, we can see this manifest now in that you can go on a computer, you can log into a website, or you can open up Photoshop, and you can take text and you could type it in, and it can give you a different image of that idea, mm -hmm. and it can do that infinitely. Every time you hit enter, it'll give you a different image. Yeah. It's like that is pure post. Well, it's as close to postmodernism as I've seen in anything. Uh, only the prompt for the AI generator matters. Mm -hmm. It's like the you, you can see how it's like it's growing out of these conceptual artists and Andy Warhol. Yep. And, and there's there's some other really interesting AI artwork happening in the late 2000s. Um, I forget the name of this artist, but he... Uh, he scanned every single Rembrandt self-portrait. And he then, uh, like, the, he made them all the same density of pixels. And then he took each one of those pixels and he had a computer look at every single pixel. Like, it'd be like the, you know, the very top left pixel mm -hmm. of every single Rembrandt canvas. Look at every single one of those pixels and find me the average color. Hmm. He does that for every pixel of every Rembrandt portrait. And what he ends up with is the average Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a blurry mess, but it actually kind of looks like a Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. And so you can see like this playing around with maybe the material doesn't matter. Maybe it is just idea. Mm -hmm. And you can see our culture is moving towards that. But that's why things like transhumanist ideology, things like um, you know, bodily autonomy, all of that is being argued over. Because we're coming out of a, an era that said the material is what matters. And we're in an area where, era where we're saying the idea matters. And Shakespeare's saying it's both. Yeah. And that's what Geit's saying, too. I think um, when, I, when I read this quote, and I might, I might be jumping way far ahead here, but the thing that it made me think of pretty, pretty quickly, especially when you started talking about names, was um, one, of, one of the first one of the first things that God tells Adam in Genesis, like as part of kind of his duties on the earth is the naming of the animals, yeah. which is a profoundly like creative act. Like if you imagine like, what would it be like to name animals when no animals had names before? That's a really creative and strange thing yeah. that, that had been asked of Adam. And it's also linked to this idea of naming and, I was just really drawn to that kind of comparison of, especially with how um, how tied into religion and imagination that this this text was, is that it seems like that's a, a biblical through line that the, he focuses actually mainly on the New Testament. I feel like in this book, that's most of what he's talking about is Jesus yeah. and the incarnation. But even in the Old Testament, this idea of uh, stewardship being related to creativity and imagination being related to that yeah. was was a really, I mean. So I would go so far as to say, like, 
an integral part of the first kind of commands or tasks that God gave man on earth. Yeah, so it's really, oh, I love that we're going here. This is this is really interesting because we really care about names. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like I think about, uh, and we can use two different names to think about the difference between the world name and the heaven name mm-hmm. or the matter and idea. And that is, you know, in the, starting in like the, 19, the post-war era in the 1950s, we get all kinds of innovation and industrialization of manufacturing. And we start getting all these home appliances. And they do not have, they, I mean, they're, in, they're of their time, yeah. which is a very modernist time where the material matters. And they come up with things like toaster, microwave, refrigerator. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not names. They're actually just telling me what it does mm-hmm. which on one hand is a really useful name yeah like it, that but that's exactly what it is it's a useful name and, and i'll go i'll go so far as to say their actual names those are the shortened versions they used to be hyper this is a microwave oven this yeah this is an oven that uses my this is a toaster oven toaster this, oven this yeah. is this was what they called them was right. this really like what is it toaster oven right oven that makes toast right and and it's like well i mean all tools are like that no yeah. they're not hammer what's a hammer it's like a hammer is what it is. It's mm-hmm. named hammer, mm-hmm. and then we hammer with it. Yeah. It wasn't named hammer because this is called hammering. Mm-hmm. It's like you can see the modern inversion of what naming means is find out what it does, and then that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. So it's like elevator. It elevates you. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. And it's like all of these, and they're like, they're generic. It doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. You know, and then people get really specific. You know, they're like, I want the espresso machine. That is, you know, the, I don't know the names, but, you know, whatever. The yeah. Nest Quick X2 5000. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that name that really doesn't tell me anything about it, but you know there's a specific about that one that you like. Mm-hmm. But it's like you don't have a name for it. Instead, you just have this label. It's mm-hmm. more like a label. On the other hand, you have the all idea name. And a great example of this is uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's company. Do you know what it's called? <laughs> it's, it's called... It's called just just goop, isn't yeah, it? Goop. Yeah, goop. And the, and the name came from this. Uh, and this is what has been reported. I don't know if it's true. I hope it's not because it's really dumb. But Gwyneth Paltrow was told that all new companies have double O's in them, like Google and Yahoo. And her initials are GP, and she just put two O's in between it. Hence, goop. Oh man. And it's like there. It's not a, like what? Like it, it's it's a. That's all idea. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with the material world. It has everything to do with the idea of what is appropriate for a company name. How does it make sense? I mean, mm-hmm. now it's just silly, but also her company's silly. So, yeah, that's fair. You know, they have <laughs> candles that smell like her uh, genitalia, so yeah, wonderful. I mean, I mean, I think, yeah, the nonsense name seems to make sense for, for a nonsense right. company. Well, and then you wonder, like, did the company become Goop <laughs> because it is Goop? Or... Did she know that she was just going to be making generally goop? <laughs> just just kind of the, the slime of whatever right. is like, oh, this doesn't matter. I'll make it. Right. And yeah. we can see like, you know, in all the things that we name, the things that we decide to name are the things that become specific enough that they arise from their grouping. You know, it's like there's just dirt. But if I like take that dirt and like, you know, pack it with some clay and fire it and turn it into a vessel, then it becomes a cup. Yeah. Even though it's technically still just dirt. Mm -hmm. It's just dirt that has had a few processes done to it. And it's like that's when it starts to become a name. And then the cup, depending on what happens to it, it might become even more specific. And then, you know, it's the Holy Grail. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, the marriage cup. It's something. It's like the name is coming out of specificity. I think think the one thing that I would – this, this feels related to what we're talking about, uh, is that I think, I think when names start to become really interesting is when they contain both elements, mm-hmm. right? And that's, that's somehow related to what we've been talking about. Is it the material or is it the, is it the person? Is it the heavenly or is it the mundane? Is it the yeah. ground or is it the earth? But I think, uh, going back to the biblical names, me and another art student here, we were having a conversation about pottery Um, she's making a lot of pottery that are tied with a lot of religious ideas and one of the things we were talking about was clay and dirt and the act of creation and if you're familiar with the the genesis creation story the one of the key kind of themes is man being made from the dust of the earth 
And then as you start to read into those words, uh, like looking at all the different translations, it's like you find these kind of layers of meaning where it wasn't um, the word Adam in some translations is like really similar to this other word, Adam, which like is a literal translation of like the red clay of the earth in this particular region. So then yeah. you, you, so you're all of a sudden you're back to this super hyper specific like refrigerator. What is man made of? He's made of the red dirt from where we're from. And then you also have Adam as we know it today, where now it contains all of these kind of layered meanings and all of these ideas of, you know, the first person or what is the chosen by God or made by God. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and there's, you can see all of these ways in which names in the Bible and names in all kinds of mythic literature throughout mm -hmm. history, like they change and they matter mm -hmm. based on the fact that the name is something where there's a connection between the person, what they are, mm -hmm. and what they do. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's like the idea of the person. Mm -hmm. You know, am I just a blonde haired white man with a curly beard, or am I that guy mm -hmm. who also teaches at Hope College and makes art? Yeah. And it's like, now you can see when you have those two things of not just what I am, but what I do, and what those things then end up meaning. Because mm -hmm. it's not just, Hopefully, it's not just he makes art, but hopefully he makes good art yeah. um, and has good ideas, not bad <laughs> ideas. Uh, and then you can see like, oh, that the name starts to mean something. So much so that like we have laws to protect people's names. Yeah. And it's like, that's what we're getting at. Like the, the idea of this bringing together of something earthly with something heavenly or something material with something that is an idea mm -hmm. starts to bring about a specificity. And this is like, to me, I just love this as an artist because regardless of any of the religious signification behind that, it means that there's like an infinite amount of potential for art making because mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're combining matter and ideas in different ways so that each time it comes out with a slightly different name. Mm -hmm. And that now, now it's not just, you know, it's not just Rothko number one, it's Rothko, you know, number two and three. And, and then you can get all these other interesting names and you can see even though they're the same colors because of the scale, because of the different location, it suddenly has a new meaning. Mm -hmm. It's a new name. Yeah. Um, which I think is a lot of, like this whole, those two notions, imagination can bring us to a place of truth and this idea of a connection between heaven and earth. All of this is centered around why he titled his book Lifting the Veil. Because he's talking about like, we li live in a veiled manner. As in we move through space and time in a way that we don't actually have a full understanding of reality. And so artwork are these little peaks where that veil of what real reality is, is suddenly shown to us. Mm -hmm. And it's, and you know, regardless of your religious beliefs, if you take that idea seriously, what that means is that everything can be meaningful, mm -hmm. that you can take a look at every carpet fiber and there might be some way if you have enough imagination and enough reasoning and skill, you might be able to make even this weird carpet in here. You might be able to take one fiber of that and turn it into something that's worthy of its own name. Yeah. It's like, Phew. that's crazy. And again, it gets at this idea where he, he talked about, he called imagination a truth bearing faculty. And he kind of, he, he starts to specify that even further to imagination not just as the means of making art, but imagination as almost this tool for piercing the veil, for yeah. making these little holes or rips in the veil that we live in and being able to see through and understand more about the world that we're, we're kind of actually living in. Right, which is, there's all kinds of reasons. So I don't want to like um, attack people who, like I, I meet so many people who are like, they say something like, I can't make art or I don't have an imagination. Mm. And it... it it makes me sad mm -hmm. because I think they're right. As in, they've they've. It's not that they don't have an imagination. It's that it's so atrophied that they can't use it very well. Mm. And um, it's hard because if you throw them into the deep end of contemporary art, it requires a lot of imagination. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you have to build up that imagination through learning a symbolic language you know there was a there for a lot of people who come from a re religious setting when they go into even a different denomination's church mm -hmm. they understand the language enough that the things they don't get 
through their imagination, they can figure it out pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But when you take, you know, like someone who did not grow up in the church and you throw them into, you know, especially one of the the really liturgical ones. I think we were, we were talking about this. We both on separate occasions visited an Orthodox church, both yeah. of us being raised in pretty, you know, contemporary Protestant traditions. And both yeah. of us felt totally out of our depth, like yeah. pretty right away. It's like, I don't know what any of this means. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> yeah. I don't, no, I don't know if I'm supposed to stand or sit. Uh-huh. And then we've got this book and it's got all these things that like everyone else is able to figure it out. But then suddenly I'm moving on to the next paragraph and they don't read that paragraph. Yep. Like, well, why, why'd that happen? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's so different. And that kind of experience happens to people when they go into contemporary art museums. Cause mm-hmm. it's like, why is there a photograph of a wall on the wall that it's a photograph of? Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, oh, man, I'm, I'm gonna have to talk to you about a lot of stuff. <laughs> We've, there's there's a lot to catch up on, and yeah. and I think that we talked about this too with like the idea of kind of losing trust in your audience. But sometimes when people go through that whole experience of having something explained to them, and then at the end of the day, it's not very good or it doesn't do anything for yeah. them. Yeah. Like for example, if my first exposure to art had been that that piece of the wall, I would have written off the entire thing. Like there's no question about it. I would have been like, yeah. oh man. That S- screw this. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I don't know. Be a doctor. Be something that matters. Right, right. That's like the same. If we take this idea that Shakespeare's getting out of like, um, bot- imagination bodies forth the form of things unknown. If we suddenly make known something that isn't obviously unknown, mm-hmm. it's gonna be like big deal. Yeah. That's why we don't like derivative artwork. Like mm-hmm. we use that word. It's like, oh, you're just cap- copying Pollock. Mm-hmm. We already know. Pollock already told us. You need to give me something I don't know. Yep. But the other thing is, is when you're trying to get something really specific, it's the same in all, in all fields. Mm-hmm. In fact, in one of my videos, I make this argument that like, what happened in modern art was akin to what happened in all of the modern fields. Like, you used to have all of these generalists leading their fields of inquiry, sometimes being experts in multiple fields. And now we have... People who go and study and make a PhD in like, you know, six to 12 years in one little area. Mm-hmm. And there's like three people on the planet who know what they're talking about. Yeah. And it's like, that's the same thing that happened to art. Like there's, there's only a couple, there's a little bit more than three, but there's only a couple people who understand what this person's getting at. Yeah. Because they've, it's not just like, what can red do? It's like, what can specific red do from a specific region on a specific canvas in specific light, like all the way down to where most of us, it's like, what is that? What does that matter? Exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I had a very, a conversation that links to this where I think me and me and a friend were talking about, why don't we know the names of, of scientists anymore? Why yeah. don't we, why are they? Because there's all these famous scientists that we know about. And we were kind of thinking about like, well, what do these scientists do? And one of the ones we brought up was a, a scientist named, um, his name is George Washington Carver. Mm-hmm. who Peanut butter. Peanut butter. And yeah. every, I feel like he's like one of the ones that everybody knows about because it's something that people first of all didn't know about before and people like care about. Yeah. And then you compare that to somebody who, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this work isn't valid. I think there is, it's, it's an unfortunate, but as science advances, you can only, as science advances, it becomes hyper specific and the necessity to invest in an enormous amount of time into something becomes necessary. So, so right. maybe like these scientists who are working on the cutting edge of quantum physics, and we have no idea who they are, but right now they're working somewhere on some crazy problem. Yeah, and that that actually gets at some interesting equivalences because there's there is a one scientist right now who's very odd and yet quite popular, and that's Michio Kaku. Um, he's an MIT uh, scientist. He's well known as a string theorist, and mm-hmm. um, he's written a book that is highly regarded, uh, or, or it's, it's very popular. Mm. And I forget the exact title of the book. We'll like link it and find it. But um, it's about like, okay, let's cut through all the crap with the specificity of where we are in technology. Let's talk about the ideas that we do care about: mm-hmm. teleportation, time travel. <laughs> You know, hyperspace or like wormholes, yeah. like all this stuff. Yeah. What's what is its actual like? Is it even possible? Mm-hmm. How many years would it take us to develop it? You know, what could we expect? Mm-hmm. And that's the whole book is like lightsabers. Like what what can happen? Yeah. And it's like, oh look, look what he's doing. He's he's been a specialist, 
But he's come out of that. He's looked around and realized no one knows what the hell's going on in physics. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, uh, you know. Yeah. And instead, he's like, I need to help connect people to these really weird ideas. Not, like, mostly just for curiosity's sake, because mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do to help people find wormholes. I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm like, uh, when, I, when I water the lawn or something, I see some in the ground mm -hmm. occasionally. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's, it's more to like get a sense of like buy-in as to why this could be interesting. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's similar to um, the way in which like Star Trek and Star Wars got kids in the 80s interested in the sciences. Yeah. It's like we need that now in the arts. Mm -hmm. Because we're in that same, like in the weeds, way out in the weeds. Mm -hmm. And we need someone to come up and say, hey, this is why you should care. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that I'm trying to do that a little bit. Yeah. Of like we're, what artists are doing. Yeah. Is they're naming, they're finding out that material things can have specific names and that sometimes the, that stuff is like wildly important mm -hmm. and can bring forth truths that regardless of where you were born and your creed and, and your culture might actually be relevant to you. Right. And it's like, that's, that's wild. Yeah. And uh, to tie it back to science, I think, to, to kind of further our analogy here is if you imagine, if you imagine people saying i don't understand science so it's not worth anything or i don't understand yeah. math so it's not worth anything which unfortunately i've heard people say before which i'm always like oh man that's that's trouble right there that's danger the fact that you think math isn't worth anything because you can't understand math is a red flag but um <laughs> uh but that is that is that's one of your icks <laughs> it's, it's sure yeah you can say that but um that that exact same thing happens with I mean, almost any form of art, whether or not it's it's a musical composition that's you know, on the on the edge of listenability because it's like very strange, or art that you don't understand, or a theater production where you're like, this is just too too weird for me. This movie was just too weird. I didn't get what happened. The ending wasn't right. I don't know. Yeah. And if you imagine that, I, I think the 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 idea of saying I didn't understand it, so it's worthless is a lot more commonly accepted in those fields, um, mm -hmm. which I don't want to say like outright is, is wrong because sometimes people are right. They're like, oh no, that wasn't very good and it just wasn't good. Mm -hmm. But it's still dangerous to make that jump and say, because I don't understand something, it's not worth pursuing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately, that is a, a, a running phenomena in the arts. Um, and it might be true often, like mm -hmm. like I will. One of one of the things that I like to talk about as well is people always look back to the past and they're like, they knew what they were doing, <laughs> they knew how to make art. And it's like, you know, if a classic example is like Shakespeare. Shakespeare was not popular in his day. Tons of people were writing plays. Shakespeare's are the only ones that we have now, basically. Mm -hmm. Like obviously they exist, but no one reads them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so we look back and we're like, people used to write like Shakespeare. It's like, no, Shakespeare wrote like Shakespeare. All of his peers didn't. Yep. And like everyone thought he was a moron. And we don't know any and, of Shakespeare's peers. And we don't even know who he is yeah. necessarily. And we don't even know if it was one person or multiple. There's all kinds of mysteries behind it. Yeah. But we, we can look back at time. We can be like, man, they used to know how to do it. It's like, no, time destroys all garbage. Mm -hmm. And the things like it's like whatever it took for this little quote of Shakespeare to get to me was it was written down somewhere. Someone listened to a play and decided it was worth to save it. Mm -hmm. And they put it in a trunk or they put it in their attic or they passed it down to their kids and they kept doing that. And every single individual in that chain kept looking at the thing and being like, yeah, I'm going to save this as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's why we have the good art. Yeah. There's tons of good art being made today, but there's also tons of bad art being made today. Just yeah. like there is all the time. And now we've got the flood of AI art coming in. So, you know, it's going to be great. But, <laughs> it's going to be harder to sort through the, the mess. Right. But that's the reality is we have a society that has been able to practice creativity to a greater degree than any other society ever in the, the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that means largely there's going to be more crap made. Yeah. And you're going to have to slog through that in order to find the gems. Mm-hmm. And, but those gems will be worth it. Like, literally, they've changed my life. That's why I, the, the channel is called Art Can Help. Yeah. It's like art can help. And it can, it can help you think about science. It can help you think about, you know, should I marry this person? Mm -hmm. It can help you think about all kinds of things. And, like, that's the, the point of this endeavor is to, to try to get at that thing of, like, 
artists are doing a unique thing. Mm -hmm. They're adding one plus one together and they're trying to get three. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they fail. I fail all the time. Yeah. And that's we just we just need to give them more time. We just need to be more patient. Yeah. On the on the note, this is I don't know if this is super related, but something I thought of is uh, on the note of like time kind of destroys the garbage. I remember seeing this thing someplace where somebody was. It was it was I think like History Channel ancient aliens like where it's like there's a little bit of scientific fact that has been extrapolated to like the craziest and what the to the, like the furthest logical extreme and what they're doing is they're looking at um, ancient buildings mm-hmm. and the, the the conspiracy that they are trying to draw was something along the lines of um, aliens built the pyramids because pyramids are everywhere and I remember then watching some guy make a YouTube video of it and he said. You've overlooked the the most basic argument against this, which is that there are pyramids everywhere because pyramids are the only structure that apparently will stay standing after two thousand years. Like they're yeah. the only one. Like it's actually that's just the best way to stack rocks. Is all you've discovered is the pyramid. Right. But the aliens totally told <laughs> the us aliens that. taught us the best way to stack the rocks. But yeah, <laughs> what we were doing before <laughs> it wasn't no working. No, yeah, we were doing these Karens and yeah. jerks came and kicked them over all the time. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, Well, this to me seems like the next place of our conversation needs to go is uh, something along these lines of like, how do we start teaching ourselves to develop our imaginations, to develop our, our, uh, our fluency in the language of visual art? And how can we start like interacting with art so that we can start seeing it as these deep things? Mm -hmm. I think that's, yeah, that that seems about right is this kind of if, if imagination is such a powerful tool that it can be used for as a truth bearing faculty and also as a an untruth bearing faculty something that creates lies yeah um how do we differentiate between the two and how do we practice that skill right, right yeah we'll have to start with how do we practice then we'll figure out how do we differentiate yeah I've got an idea of what we won't do Eric Neumann yet. We'll, we'll push that down the road. Kick it further. down the road another time. Um, yeah, so you have time to read it all. Um, yeah, excellent. This has been great. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Gabe.